Hebrews chapter 1, we're going to attempt to go through the book of Hebrews. One day? Not in one day. <laughs> I think we're getting to verse 3 today. Uh, the author of Hebrews is unknown. We do not know the author of Hebrews. Many, many believe that it's Paul. There is, it has a Pauline or a Paul-like structure. So some believe that it's Paul, but um, the truth is we, we don't know who wrote, we don't know who wrote Paul or wrote, wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, but man, Hebrews is an anthem. And it is, it is quite uh, just just within the verses that I have just been studying this week, my heart has been stirred. My affections for Christ have been stirred in such a way. And uh, as we begin this, I want to start by saying that when a Christian, when Christians say things like Jesus is Lord, when you hear that terminology, Jesus is Lord, this has this has theological ramifications. And this means that Jesus is literally the owner of or the, the final authority or the boss over all of creation. This means that he owns everything that is seen and unseen. He owns it all. He's sovereign over all things. He is the king. The entire Bible points to the fact that Jesus is the point of the Bible. And the Bible points often and over and over and over and over and over again to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus is throughout. He is the center of the scriptures. No human being is to be considered the, the center point or the point of the text. The point of the text is Jesus. The point of seeing all of the characters in the scriptures point to the fact that Jesus is the greater of all of them. The greater Adam, the greater Moses, the greater David. Jesus is the point. He is king. He is God. Think about that. Think about as we prayed this morning, think about who you're praying to. You are praying to, you are communing with the God of the universe. Not a God, but the single only God of the universe. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is Jesus Christ. He is the judge. He is the final authority. He rules over all things. Jesus is everything. Jerry Bridges once stated, it seems we will allow God, we will, I'm sorry, it seems we will allow God to anywhere except upon his throne ruling his universe according to his good pleasure and according to his sovereign will. We're going to see here in the next several verses of Hebrews that Christ is the supreme. He is the superlative. He is top shelf. He is over everything. Not man, but he is the one who is in charge. We'll start in verse one. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So that's verse one. So over the course of about 1800 years, through over through 39 different books of the Old Testament, through visions, symbols, parables, and poetry, God spoke to his people. He revealed himself through the faithful spiritual forefathers, the prophets of the Old Testament, pointing what did, what did these Old Testament prophets do? They were pointing towards something. And more specifically, they were pointing towards someone. They were pointing to the fact that Christ was coming. The Messiah was coming. Some have asked me personally, and I've heard it asked of other preachers, how did 
the people in the Old Testament, how were they saved, Pastor? Men and women in the Old Testament were saved by grace through faith, alone, in Christ, alone. Just like those in the New Testament were saved by grace through faith, alone, in Christ alone. They believed in the person and work of the Messiah before it happened. They were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. We look back at the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were looking forward to it and believing that it was going to happen. You will find that out in Hebrews chapter 11. We are not going to get there today. But um, <laughs> you, you will see that. They had faith. Abraham had faith, just like you have faith. Abraham was saved by grace through faith. Adam was saved by grace through faith. Moses was saved by grace through faith. Enoch was saved by grace through faith. We'll see that, like I said, in Hebrews chapter 11. But the writer here states that is, this is how God spoke. God spoke this way in the Old Testament through the prophets, through the people that were given the authority to, to speak on behalf of God. But then you get into verse 2 and shows us what we are experiencing today. Verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 1. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So we see from this text that Christ came and he fulfilled everything that was needed to be fulfilled. Everything that was talked about in the Old Testament, everything that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, Christ came and he fulfilled that. Christ spoke this out. He fulfilled everything out. He finished what was needed to be finished for men and women to understand the good news. In these last days, God has spoken through to us by his son. And the Jews understood, as you read this, the Jews in this moment understood the last days to mean the time when the Messiah would come. They looked forward to it. They longed for it. And sadly, today, the Jews do not understand that Christ did everything that was needed to redeem and reconcile and forgive them and save them. They're still longing and looking for their Messiah, but I'm going to tell you there's coming a day that Christ will get those he needs to get. This, this also shows us that everything we need, everything that we need is right here. Everything that is needed for life and godliness is right here in the text. Jesus was the final Revelation. Everything was completed when Christ came to this world. We live in a religious world today that everyone is looking for a fresh word and a fresh revelation to bring to the, to the masses that are in need. We see and hear many who stand behind pulpits just like this and say today, I've got a fresh word from God. I'm going to tell you something. If a preacher stands behind this spot, behind this a podium like this and says, I've got a fresh new word from God, please do not believe that, Pastor. Because we do not need fresh new revelation. Every revelation that you needed was right here in this text. Everything that we need is in the Bible. Everything, every word, every jot, every tittle, every word you need from God has been put down in this book. You don't need anything else. And listen, people say, well, I just want to hear God speak. Read, read the Bible. I'd like to hear God speak audibly. Then read the Bible out loud. Come on. Yeah, you want to hear God speak out loud? Listen, the Bible app reads to you out loud. I, when I go on my walks, that's what I, I plug in. I got through Revelation chapter 12 the other day. Woo! You want to hear God speak audibly? Read your Bible out loud. This is God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says... All scripture has been theopneuskis, 
been God breathed. You're looking at, you're reading the breath of God on paper. Jesus said and did everything that was needed for life, salvation, and godliness. In fact, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might be that we might receive adoption as sons. That's right. Woo! At the fullness of time, at just the right time, everything aligned, language, governments, political systems, religious systems, God sent forth his son to redeem those who would believe. There, there's no further need for a fresh word or a fresh revelation. Everything that we need was completed in the coming of Christ Jesus. So when this happened when Christ came, he came to buy back everything that Adam forfeited. When he created the world, he gave dominion. Let, let, so let's let's do a little history. Let's back up. Because when you read the text, what does it say there? It says that, that in this time he spoke by, to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. So the heir to everything is Jesus. Jesus owns it all. Now, how do we know that? Because in the beginning, in, in the book of Genesis, who, who had all of it? Who did God give this to in the beginning? Adam and Eve. He gave it to Adam and he said, what? I give you dominion. I, I'm giving you dominion. Go, be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the beasts of the field. Cultivate it. Build it. Conquer. Go. Right? Everything was given to Adam. And Satan hated that God did that. He was so livid. He could not stand that Adam had dominion. And what did he do? He rebels, comes to earth, and weasels his way in. Just like he does in your life today. He weasels his way in to try to steal, kill, and destroy and he weasels in and he takes what was originally given to Adam as heir. He said, this is yours. Take care of it. And what happens? He forfeits the farm. Adam gives it away. And when I, he disobeys God and hands everything over to the devil, how do we know that it's the devil's? Because during the temptation of Christ, there was a point in which the devil takes Jesus upon a high place and shows him the kingdoms of the world said, this all belongs to me. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give it back to you. Wait a second. This is the reason I think, this is the reason I know the devil didn't understand what Jesus was doing. Because if he had, not, if he had figured out what Jesus was doing, he would have done everything in his power to try to keep that brother alive. Yeah, right. Don't let this, don't let it die. No, 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 no. Why? Because when he shed his blood on Calvary's cross, he took back everything. He ran, he, as, as Doug Van Dorn says, he ransacked hell and took the keys to death. And he took back the title deed to earth and it's his. Why? Because on Matthew 28, as he's ascending, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth. Has been given to me. He took it back. He bought it back with his blood. Yeah. Everything belongs to Jesus. How do we? Whom he appointed the heir of all things. So God appoints Christ to inherit all things. He bought it back. He, as he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. To Not only did he do that for the forgiveness of sins. He did that also. He's taking everything back. It's mine. And this is a beautiful thing. He's invited us in to be a part of it. He's going to adopt us as his kids and say, listen, enjoy. Enjoy. So he's taking back everything that he made. And by what he did on the cross, he takes, like I said, he takes back creation and he saves and redeems human beings. What a beautiful, 
What a beautiful thing to see. And if not only that, let's keep going to verse 3 and see what happens here. The Son, Jesus, radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command or his word. So we see here in this one verse that Jesus, listen, you want to know something? Jesus is God. Jesus is God, and he is the visible representation of God himself. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all of creation. Oh, if that doesn't get you going this morning, I don't know what will. Jesus is king. Jesus is king over all of it. So because Jesus is God, we can trust that his rule is absolutely good. Alexander Carson stated once that God's sovereignty is always to his people in wisdom and in love. This is the difference between sovereignty and God and sovereignty and man. We dread the sovereignty of man because we have no security of it being exercised in mercy or even in justice. But we rejoice in the sovereignty of God because we are sure it is always exercised for the good of his people. That should just, like, that just, I'm talking about stir you up. But God loves you. And he's redeemed you, and his sovereignty is like a beautiful warm blanket on a cold winter's night. Oh, we see that. So we see the reality in this next part of the text. Look at look at this part in verse three. When he cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. So Jesus, after he did all of this, after Jesus came and was born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life for 33 years, was crucified on Calvary's cross, and three days later he was raised for our justification, what happens now? After this, he was able to free us as a result of doing all of that. He frees us from our sin. He frees you from your sin. He sat down next to his father. And we know from Romans chapter 8 what he's doing at the right hand of his father. Oh, you want to know? Okay, good. I'm glad you did because I'm going to read it to you. 8.31, Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. And more than that, he was raised and he sits at the right hand of the Father of God, who in who indeed is interceding for us. So what is Jesus doing at the right hand of his father? He is interceding on the behalf of his kids. That one, guess what? We also know that the devil is accusing Christians. Do you see what Tyler did? Do you see what Chancey did? Do you see what Matt did? What does Jesus do? Mine, mine, mine. Amen. Mine, mine, mine. They have no condemnation according to Romans 8 1. Jesus is now at the right hand of God the Father, interceding on the behalf of his children. This is absolutely glorious news. So, dear Christian, this morning, any and all sins you have committed or will commit 
are completely paid for and forgiven as a result of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Don't let what people think about you deter you from living a purposeful, holy, godly, and meaningful life. Yes. In the kingdom, it will not matter what people think of you. All that matters in the kingdom of heaven is what the Lord Jesus Christ thinks of his kids. And what do we know about that? Ephesians chapter 1 says that he thinks an awful lot of us. He lavished his grace upon us. People, amen. He, he lavished his grace upon us. All that matters is what the Lord Jesus of glory thinks. Press in hard to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Press in hard to the person and the work of Christ on Calvary's cross. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate a child of God from God. How do we know this? Because in Romans chapter 8 verse 35 it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall so, so tri so tribulation, shall distress, so, shall persecution, or maybe famine, nakedness, danger of the sword? As it's written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. Well, what do we do? Oh, no. Are these things going to, are these going to deter us? Are these going to separate us? Verse 37. In, oh, no. In all of these things, in all of what things? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger of the sword. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors. You are more than a conqueror in Christ through him who loved us. So because of what Christ has done, we have the ability and the access to conquer. Christ is Lord of everything. He's king. If you read Revelation, the, the letters of the seven churches over and over. He who conquers. He who conquers. He who, and he's talking about, he's talking to the people in the church. Those who finish strong, who, it doesn't matter. Listen, I'm thankful that you started your journey with Christ. But what matters is how you finish. Do you finish strong? I would encourage everybody in here to get online Amazon and order Steve Farrar's book called Finishing Strong. Everybody should read Finishing Strong. One of the best books on the planet. Steve has gone on to glory. One of the, one of the mighty men. History will show that Steve Farrar is one of the mighty men of God in our day. And I'm telling you, his book, Finishing Strong, will just embolden a Christian. Christ the Lord, he is king over everything. He is, it is not up for debate. He is the one who conquers. So because Jesus conquered, I can conquer. If I've been conquered by Christ, I can conquer in this life. But I must get rid of my sin. I must repent. I must ask Jesus to forgive me. And here's the beautiful truth is that if you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from every ounce of your sinfulness. I don't think you Caleb, you don't know what I've done. Have you read the Bible? Have you read what some of these brothers and sisters did in the text? <laughs> there, that if, uh, if we're comparing your junior varsity compared to David, right. your junior varsity when it comes to Paul. But don't, but don't get don't get it twisted. You're still wicked. And you still need a savior. You still need to be redeemed. You still have been immoral. You have still lied. You've stolen. You've taken God's name in vain. You have not honored your parents. You've broken the law of God and you need a savior. But Jesus is here and he's saying, hello. I, I have, the, the good news has come. He's come. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Wow. Wow. And then you see, 
all throughout the rest of this text, having having become having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than others. For to which of these angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be as to me a son. Listen, because of Jesus, we have the ability and access to the father. We have been granted adoption as sons. Because of Jesus, because of what Christ has done. And listen, this is not up for debate. God is the sovereign king. He is Lord. He's not a God. He is the God. And all these other people, well, there's many gods. There's many paths to God. I need to lovingly tell you this. Every other person, every other individual that is worshiping Allah, uh, Confucius, Hinduism, Mormonism, you listen, Catholicism, they're worshiping demons. They are demons who are who are impersonating a deity. There is only one name under heaven which man shall be saved, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's it. And I, listen, I want to encourage us as we find as, as we finish out this part of the text. I know we're in an election year. Come on. Get it? And everybody's like, whoa, who's going to get in? Who's going to win? I need, okay, I want to just lovingly remind us. You need to understand this about this nation. This planet is not ruled by a democracy, it is not ruled by a constitutional republic. I know that that is controversial to say. But it doesn't matter who's in Congress or who's in the White House. It is King Jesus who owns and rules everything. The scriptures tell us that in Psalms that the king's heart is like a river in the hands of God. He directs it the way he wants it to go. He directs whoever's president. He's directing the hearts of the president. To do his will. So golly Caleb. I don't like what God's doing with President Biden. We deserve it. We deserve it. And let, let me just be honest. I don't care which one of them gets in at the end of this. They're both a judgment from God. I don't care. You know, Wait a minute. I'm a Trump supporter. Okay, That's fantastic. He is a arrogant prideful man. Joe's a wicked dude. I don't care. They're both a judgment from God. Unless America repents, we're done. We're done. But for the glory, for, for the here's here's beauty. In ten thousand years, I'm not standing on the Constitution. I'm standing on the Word of God. And listen, I say that as a red-blooded American who loves freedom and loves the ability that we get to do this. I thank God for our soldiers. I thank God for our police. They are, God has ordained government to protect its people. But I'm going to tell you this. The glorious and sovereign Lord Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'll even, he's the president of presidents. So you want to bring it into that? He is the one who is divinely moving the people and the parts and the nations to where he wants them to be. Like, this is a divine chess game. He is moving the parts where he wants it. There's nothing, no, there's the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not up in heaven going, Whoa. Did you see what the Democrats did? Oh my gosh, the Republicans. Seriously? Like, he's not, they're not doing that. The communists. Oh my gosh. Are you, no, he's not doing that. He is sovereign. He is, we know from the book of Psalms that he is king over the flood, not just for a couple of days, forever. God is the sovereign forever, and he is doing his will. 
He is moving all the, the pieces divinely where he wants them for his own good pleasure and judgment on people. We know from Romans chapter 1 that a, a nation that suppresses the truth and does not long for godliness will experience the wrath of God's abandonment. What does that look like? God literally says, okay, you want to go do these things? I'm going to just go ahead and take my hands off the wheel. And in, in the book of Thessalonians, we know that God actually will shove a nation in the direction that it wants to go and cause them to believe a lot. That's where America is. We need to repent of our sins. We need to confess and repent our, to, of our sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to return to a, a Christian nation. So, Caleb, America's never been a Christian nation. Right. The documentation in stone, literally all over the East Coast, would say otherwise. It's literally in statues and buildings, and on the buildings in Washington, D.C., in marble. It is stamped in marble for all to see that Jesus is king over and over and over again. So what do we do to that? Okay, look, there's people that don't believe. Okay, Take comfort in the fact that he awakened you. He awoke you to the reality of your sin. How many people in Cedarville, Kansas this morning are not even, it, their sin is not even on their radar. They woke up this morning entrenched in their sin and they don't even, they're not even, you know what they're thinking? I want bacon. I'd like a cup of coffee. They're not thinking about the wicked things they did last night or last week. They're not thinking about those things or even concerned about them. But you are. How do I know? Because you're here. Like the God that's even stirred you to be in this room is not an accident. You're sovereignly here for a reason. Now, Caleb, my, my, I'm not. I'm here because I wanted to. Okay, great. That's awesome. But also. <laughs> Because God wanted you here. He awoke, he awoke you to the reality of who he is and who you are. And some of you in this room today need to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You need to repent of your sins and you need to trust the gospel. Some of you who are hearing this message need to repent. And what do we know? then he'll purify you of your sins. He'll wipe the slate clean. He'll Not only will he wipe the slate clean, he'll adopt you and make you one of his kids with all the rights and privileges and duty that come with that. What a glorious truth. Like, take comfort in the fact that God awoke you to the reality of who you are and who he is. Take comfort in the fact that he didn't leave you where you were. Because as the king of the universe, he didn't have to. He doesn't have to awaken anyone to the reality of their sins. But he did you. I, I, let's do, I know I'm not charismatic, but man, let's jump some pews on that one. <laughs> let's get a little excited. This Baptist is like, Jesus saved me from my sins. Yay. I know we're Baptists, but you know, you gotta get a little excited every once in a while. That's the funny thing. Like, there's gonna be people in heaven, we're gonna be like, oh, how did they get here? And they're gonna look at some of you and go, how did you get here? Take comfort in the fact that Jesus is king, that he is Lord over all, and that God has granted him. And made him the heir of all things. And guess what? He's adopting you and bringing you in. Like that just like that just blows my mind. I know me. I am an absolute wicked wretch. And that God decided to say, wake up, brother. It's just like my gratitude level. I, it is bananas to think about that Jesus did that for me. I don't deserve that. What I absolutely deserve is God just to go. You're done. 
That's what I deserve. But because he loved me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, come on, being rich in mercy with the great love with which he loved us, you've been saved by grace. That's glorious. Yeah. That Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you're here this morning, and that's you, here's the challenge. Here's the invitation. You know, Caleb, you given an invitation? Here's my invitation. And listen, I've had some brothers take me up on this invitation. At the end of church, I'm going to be back there by that back door. I want you to come grab me, shake my hand and say, Brother Caleb, I need to be saved. Amen, Robert? Amen, Zach? The ground around the cross is level. I don't care how messy you've been. I don't care how messy you are. Sure. Jesus can take the mess and turn it into a miracle. How do I know? Because you look at it, one. <laughs> so I don't like looking at you. Okay, look around the room. Find somebody that you like to look at. And those that have been saved by grace through faith, he took that mess and turned it into a mirror. Come on. All it takes is you just, just for just a split second saying, okay, I'm going to lay my pride down for a second and own that I'm a sinner because guess what? We all know you are. And here's the even bigger thing. God does too. You ain't tricking him. You're not, he's not up in heaven going, is he a sinner? I can't, I don't know. Like God knows. Just own it. God, I am a sinner. I have done everything that the Bible says not to do. Done it. Forgive me. Forgive me of my sin. I want you to be the Lord. Because guess what? You don't make him Lord. He's already Lord. That's right. You don't make him king. He is already king. You just kind of come in agreement with the king. The king's already, you just come into agreement. That's all you're doing. Christ is already here. He doesn't, he doesn't lower himself down to come. Oh, come. All right. Now that you said, I'll be the Lord, will you please be the king of my life? Wait, oh, he already is. Will you, will you be the Lord? He already is Lord. And it, you're either going to experience the Lord of mercy or you're going to experience the Lord of justice. He's Lord regardless. The offer of mercy stands today. Come and find grace. Come and find mercy. And I'm telling you, your life will never look the same.